I feel very blessed and privileged to be a member of the ACL study group. I joined this international group of knee surgeons in 1996. That meeting was in Nevis, and we were at her sister meeting in St. Kitts in the 2023 biannual meeting. My abstract as submitted, optimal joint loading strategies to lessen cartilage changes after ACL reconstruction. However, we tweaked it a little bit and is now entitled Staying Within the Envelope of Function. Both joint overloading and underloading can be detrimental to cartilage health early after ACL reconstruction. Picture of beautiful St. Kitts, Nevis way in the background with the clouds. I have nothing to disclose relative to this talk. I would like to thank my co-authors, medical students Dalton House, Sawyer Blair, our PhD researchers in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at the University of Kentucky, Caitlin Conley, Brian Noren, Cale Jacobs, and also Dr. Darren Johnson. The purpose was to determine whether relative under or overloading is associated with imaging and or biochemical biomarkers of cartilage de degradation after ACL reconstruction and whether these associations differ over time. We looked at 15 studies, total of 510 patients in this meta-analysis, looked at the method to detect cartilage degeneration. This was measured by imaging, either by MRI or ultrasound, or systemic biomarkers. Under and overloading was defined as either knee joint movements or vertical ground reaction forces relative to the non-operative knee. To get to these 15 studies, we screened 357, 107 abstracts manuscripts screened, 19 manuscripts were included. The study characteristics, 51% males, 49% females. Mean age was 27.7. And there were 15 studies reported. The mean number of patients was 34. Overloading versus underloading. The first post-op year, it wasn't really clear if over or underloading. So at six months, the studies that we looked at, there were five studies overloading in three by MRI and underloading in two by serum biomarkers. And then at 18 months, we see a change. So this is nine studies overloading by, again, imaging studies, six MRI, one ultrasound, and underloading by the serum biomarkers. So at 18 months post-op, MR and ultrasound overloading and the serum biomarkers stated underloading, both at six and 18 months. So the results, assessment of cartilage degeneration with these three methods, 18 months to eight years, overloading, two years, underloading, two studies, 49 patients. And are the elevated serum biomarkers due to involved knee, uninvolved knee, or other body parts? And does overloading or underloading negatively impact cartilage? We would think it would be overloading. However, using the serum biomarkers and further study investigation is necessary. So if it is something that we can detect in the serum biomarkers, perhaps we can change the milieu of the knee with injections or medications. So what are we really trying to do? Find and maintain knee homeostasis. When we talk to patients, we need to use terms that the patients understand. Envelope of function, the sweet spot, happy knee. This is a tennis racket, and if you follow tennis, there's a good way to hit it and a bad way to hit it. So if we look at the most power in blue down below, then you have a center of percussion, which is the lowest shock, and then you have the node up above in green, which is minimum vibration. So all of this transmits to our arm. So you got to find that sweet spot and stay there with your knee, happy knee. Find and maintain knee homeostasis. We don't want to blow out our strings in a tennis racket. We'd like that envelope to be very, very large, but sometimes people's envelopes are smaller. So avoid leaving your sweet spot and stay within the envelope of function, as Scott Dye popularized many years ago. Post-op protocol should be to restore range of motion, including extension and strength. Normalize gait. If possible, use gait analysis. Does weight-bearing and a locked post-op knee brace cause the articular cartilage problem early? Probably would be better to start range of motion and gait, such as with an alter G or if patients would use crutches. Normalize gait with this underwater treadmills. Partial weight bearing with crutches and no brace is better. However, my post-op patients don't like to use crutches. And then later return to impact cutting sports. These should all be included in our post-op protocols, as well as counseling the patient on the sweet spot and finding that sweet spot and staying in it.
The OptiNee consensus meta-analysis, it was 66 studies, 81 unique potential risk factors were identified. This was a group of sports scientists and physical therapists. The participants came from the following five countries, Canada, five, Denmark, four, Netherlands and Sweden, two each, and Australia, one. The reason that this is important is because of their conclusions with this meta-analysis, which was uh, very well done, 66 studies. The consensus had many clinical implications and conclusions, many tables. ACL reconstruction does not reduce risk for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. The perceived value of early ACL reconstruction cited as protective or harmful for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. How is post-traumatic osteoarthritis affected by delayed ACL reconstruction, not returning to pivoting sports, rehab and non-op? For these questions, there was no definitive answer and a need of evidence-based studies. This is on us, orthopedists and researchers, clinician scientists. Many more questions than answers. The older I get, the more questions I have than answers. Optini consensus, manage expectation about risk after ACL reconstruction, no clear treatment targets for preventing OA after injury or surgery, implement evidence-based injury prevention programs like guardians of the knee, weight loss, quadricep strengthening. These were their recommendations. At the ACL study group meeting in Beaver Creek in 1998, I had the privilege to hang out with Scott Dye, who was on my right, and he was the one that coined this envelope of function, comparing the knee to a biologic transmission. His work was in 1996. Also with Ed Voitis, Freddie Fu, Don Fithian, and Gilchrist, he talked about factors contributing to the function of the knee joint after injury or reconstruction in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, 1998. His concepts ring true in that sweet spot of the knee. Store the measurable anatomic, structural, and biomechanical characteristics, and normal pre-injury knee function has been restored or fixed, and therefore it's safe to return to sport, and therefore even osteoarthritis will be prevented. The problem is normal structural and biomechanical characteristics or parameters does not equal normal knee function. There is a different emerging paradigm that views joints as living metabolically active systems of billions of cells, and each tissue or volumes of cells has its own metabolic characteristics we call tissue homeostasis. This was a keynote that Scott Dye gave at the Issacos meeting in Lyon, France. And think about that tissue homeostasis, these metabolically living active systems of billions of cells. So what can we do to those cells to reduce the risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis? I think that's the next tier of what we as orthopedic surgeons are going to be able to do. We can create a stable knee, but can we create a normal knee as it was in its pre-injury state? I think not. The knee as a biologic transmission with an envelope of function, so we can think of these zones as loading, disuse, homeostasis, overuse, overload, and then structural failure, as in that tennis racket analogy. And the goal of treatment of knee disorders is to maximize the envelope of function as safely and predictably as possible and inform the patients of a lower threshold of function, inform them early on that you want to see them and follow them with yearly x-rays standing. So when we do gait analysis on our post-op patient, this patient is 10 months following right ACL reconstruction. And you can see on the sagittal view, she has an anteriorly rotated pelvis. Her back is in a lumbar lordotic position forward trunk flexion, pelvic tw tilt. She's got a positive Trendelenburg. So when she lands on her right side, boom, her left hip drops. She has less knee flexion by 8 degrees and less hip adduction by 11 degrees. Clinically, she has a stable knee, has good quad tone and muscle strength. But if you look at this dynamics on this gait, it's really pretty horrifying that we're gonna let her go back and play with these hip abnormalities. So if you think about overloading, underloading of the knee, I dare say that this knee is being overloaded because of the Trendelenburg, the hip loss of strength, this positive Trendelenburg wherever she lands, boom, and lands on a knee that is less flexed and a hip that is less adducted. So I think gait analysis, perhaps just with force plates in the field, but gait analysis critical for return to play safely and knowing when these athletes are ready. So we need to simplify this gait 
analysis and get it out to training rooms and to the field even, make it mobile. This is a 36-year-old professional basketball athlete, underwent a right allograft ACL reconstruction. She had had prior left patellofemoral osteoarthritis. So here's her patellofemoral osteoarthritis right here, and that's not the involved side. So this is the side that she ended up tearing her ACL. And two years following ACL reconstruction, you might say, oh, the graft's too vertical. This was done by another surgeon. It was an allograft. But look what happens to her knee. Here's two years, and here's three years post-op. And again, it was her opposite side where she had some notch, um, notch osteophytes and patellofemoral osteoarthritis that I was treating her for. She'd been playing basketball since she was 10, and she is now in her 30s and is playing at a professional uh, level in basketball. She came to me with mechanical signs. So this is her intact graft in the upper left. And you can see that degenerative meniscus tear. But unfortunately, as seen on the right, inferior pole of the patella, significant osteoarthritis, non-articulating facet, and bare bone on the medial femoral condyle seen in the lower right. So what do we do with this person in their 30s? She did continue to play professional basketball for a few more years. So think of this as knee pack years, as in smoking. The additive effect of years of participation in basketball so it's similar to pack years of smoking on the lungs. There are pack years of activity on the knees. And are there too many pack years of basketball, perhaps? Another factor in post-traumatic osteoarthritis, number of pack years on knees. Orthopedic surgeons can stabilize the knee, but not restore it to pre-injury state. We must communicate it honestly with our patients about risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, get yearly follow-up with clinical exam, and standing x-rays. So that mosaic of the normal knee cannot be reconstructed with an ACL. Patients need to be taken care of and their knee health followed up. Thank you very much for your attention. St. Kitts was a great spot for the ACL study group on the beach, on the catamaran. Appreciate your attention.